alcohol is such a devastating hammer when it comes to sleep. There was well over a 50% 5-0 drop in their growth hormone release during alcohol-laced sleep at wow. night. Uh, with the rise of sleep trackers, I think you really have some objective data on the downside of alcohol. Terrifying. When alcohol is present in the brain and bloodstream, that the architecture of sleep is disrupted. Slow wave sleep. You're looking for a strategy to destroy your sleep. Um, just drink. I think we all know alcohol negatively affects our sleep, but to what degree? In this video, I've put clips together from various podcasts from some of the leading experts in sleep and urology to give you all the information you need about the subject. Enjoy. So perhaps the most misunderstood sleep aid um, is actually alcohol. Now, alcohol is a class of drugs that we call the sedatives, and sedation is not sleep. But when people use alcohol in the evenings, they mistake the former for the latter. They think alcohol makes them fall asleep quicker. It doesn't, it's just knocking out your cortex in the brain and sedating you more quickly. So you lose consciousness, but you're not going into naturalistic sleep. The second problem with alcohol is that it will litter your sleep with many more awakenings throughout the night. So you're going to be waking up more frequently, which means that your sleep isn't what we call consolidated. You don't have one nice, long, continuous bout throughout the night. The third problem with alcohol is that it's very good at blocking your dream sleep, something that we call rapid eye movement sleep, which is essential for a number of different reasons. So alcohol in terms of a sleep aid is anything but, um, and I would suggest, despite it being largely unpopular advice, that you should forego the nightcap um, and you will have better sleep as a consequence. Alcohol is such a devastating hammer when it comes to sleep. I mean, if you want to come totally. up with a way, if you're, if you're looking for a strategy to destroy your sleep, um, just drink. The sleep that one gets after even just one, yes, even just one, glass of wine or a beer is not the same sleep that you get when you don't have alcohol circulating in your system. Dr. Walker told me, and it certainly is supported by lots and lots of quality peer reviewed studies in animals and in humans, that when alcohol is present in the brain and bloodstream, that the architecture of sleep is disrupted. Slow wave sleep, deep sleep, and rapid eye movement sleep, all of which are essential for getting a restorative night's sleep are all disrupted. So for those of you that are drinking a glass or two of wine or having a a hard liquor drink or a beer in order to fall asleep, the sleep you're getting is simply not high quality sleep or certainly not as high quality as the sleep you'd be getting if you did not have alcohol in your system. Of course, when we're talking about hangover, we're talking generally about the consumption of more than just one or two drinks. Of course, for some people, one or two drinks is probably sufficient to induce hangover, but for most people, it's gonna be having three or four, exceeding the their typical limit, as it's called. Again, not the legal limit, that's a whole other business. But when one ingests too much alcohol for them, one of the reasons they feel terrible the next day is because their sleep isn't really good sleep. In fact, it's not even sleep, it's often considered pseudo sleep, or at least that's what it's called in the sleep science field, because people are in kind of a low level hypnotic kind of trance, it's not real sleep, there are multiple bouts of waking up, they may not even realize they're waking up multiple times described it before as a sort of self-generated therapy that occurs while we sleep. Yeah, it's which, overnight therapy. You know, it's emotional first aid. Uh, well, is, certainly is people that don't get enough sleep um, are very easy to derail emotionally. Yeah. Um, not that one would want to do that to people, but we all sort of fall apart emotionally. Our, I, I, I always think of it as almost like our skin sensitivity can be heightened yes, when absolutely. we are sleep deprived. Um, our emotional sensitivity um, is such that when we're sleep deprived, uh, such that it takes a um, much finer grain of sandpaper to create that kind of friction. In terms of translating this to behavior, I'm not, I don't particularly enjoy alcohol. I guess I might be fortunate in that sense, but I also have never really experienced the, the pleasure of, of drinking uh, alcohol. I sometimes like the taste of, of a drink, but I never like the sensation. So that's, uh, I don't mm -hmm. have a lot of, of familiarity with this, but many people do, and I understand that. So let's say, um, somebody uh, enjoys a glass of wine or two with dinner and they eat dinner at 7 p.m. Is that likely to disrupt their sleep at all? Let's just sort of, let's make this a, a series of gradations. Yeah, and the answer is, is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think once they just looked at a single glass of wine in the evening with dinner and I would be untruthful if I didn't just 
simply say it has uh, an effect mm -hmm. and we can measure that uh, in terms less of less REM sleep, less REM sleep. Mm -hmm. And one of the fascinating studies, I can't remember what dose, I think they got them close to a standard um, illegal blood alcohol level. So maybe they were a little bit tipsy. And yes, you see all of the changes that we just described. Um, they sort of lose consciousness more quickly. They have fragmented sleep and they have a significant reduction in REM sleep. But what was also interesting because REM sleep, as we spoke about before, is a time when some hormonal systems are essentially recharged and refreshed, growth hormone being one of them. There was well over a 50%, five zero drop in their growth hormone release during alcohol-laced sleep at wow. night. Um, I was a club promoter for a very long time. Uh, so I, I was in the trenches partying hard for all of my 20s, which is why your uh, 90th to 100th year estimation, I think is uh, unfortunately gonna be a little bit too generous. But I went sober for six months, really loved it. Um, most to do with the lifestyle changes, cognitive. Yeah. Uh, cognitive improvements, uh, what it meant in terms of habit, in terms of consistency, energy, uh, money, time, all that stuff. Came back to drinking, didn't like it. Went back sober for another six months. Came back to drinking for a couple of months, didn't like it. Did a thousand days sober. Uh, I never had a, a, an issue with substances, but just really loved what it had done for me. And, you know, five years hence, six years hence now, the low and no movement seems to be really, really gaining speed. Is that... So why is it so surprising? Like, why is it that something that ostensibly, obviously wasn't that good for us is now only just beginning to kind of get some momentum of people thinking, oh, maybe this thing that makes me feel like a total pile of dog shit the next day is something that I shouldn't take all the time. I, I don't know. I can't speak to it. The only thing I could speculate is that with the, uh, with the rise of sleep trackers, I think you really have some objective data on the downside of alcohol. Terrifying. And I don't, I don't think anybody who's worn a whoop who doesn't look at their heart rate variability pre and post alcohol consumption or the fragmentation of their sleep is not saying what the hell. It's insane. Why is it such an impact for the, for the unindoctrinated amongst us? Let's say that you've got a heart rate variability of 70. If you were to have two glasses of beer or two small glasses of wine on an evening, finishing at nine or 10 PM and then go to sleep on the night it wouldn't surprise me if from 70, your heart rate variability is down in the 30s yeah. or the 40s. What is happening inside of the body that's causing that to happen? So alcohol is metabolized um, into different elements, but but one of the metabolic byproducts of alcohol is quite toxic. And um, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect what's happening is the toxicity of that is changing the autonomic nervous system. So in what, we, what you want to be doing when you're sleeping is in a maximally parasympathetic state, um, that the so-called rest and digest state. And that's really what heart rate variability is measuring, right? Heart rate variability along with other things such as heart rate itself and temperature, respiratory rate, are proxies for your autonomic nervous system. And anytime those things move in the wrong direction, so heart rate goes up, heart rate variability goes down, respiratory rate goes up, temperature goes up, all of those things happen when you drink. That to me is a very strong signal that something about the toxicity of the metabolic byproduct of ethanol is putting the body into more of a fight or flight response as opposed to a rest and digest response. It's so hilarious that the thing that a lot of people use and has been used for a long time, I can't get to sleep, I'll have a glass of whiskey, uh, isn't really aiding with sleep, it's just sedating people. Yeah, that's the insidious thing about it, right, is people confuse sedation, consciousness, and sleep. And I, I, you know, I love to tell the glib anecdote, right? Which is like, if I hit you over the head with a baseball bat, you would lie motionless for 12 hours. But of course, there is no confusion over the fact that you are not sleeping and nothing about that experience is good for your brain or your body in terms of rest and recovery.